Hi, Gusio, Hafade, and Aloha Mai Kako. Welcome to this virtual panel discussion in conjunction with the United Nations Human Rights Council 49th session in Geneva, Switzerland. This event is titled Demilitarizing the Pacific is Urgent and is sponsored by the Kiwani Foundation and the Peace for Okinawa Coalition. Additionally, we would like to thank our Commonwealth 670 and the Ryukyu Independence Action Network for their support. The conflict in Ukraine demonstrates the volatility of world conditions. For generations, the original peoples of the Pacific have protested the imposed militarization of our islands by the United States as it puts us in grave danger. The major US military buildup in the Pacific, along with their recent mishaps, show that the US has no regard for the people's safety and welfare and much less so in the event of an attack, especially involving nuclear weapons. In this panel discussion, representatives of Hawaii, the Mariana Islands, including Guam, and the Luchu Islands, including Okinawa, implore the Human Rights Council to protect our people from being targets in foreign conflicts by demanding the United States denuclearize and demilitarize our islands. All of today's speakers in this panel discussion is indigenous. My name is Robert Kajiwara. I am indigenous Luchuan, also known as Uchinanchu or Okinawan. I am founder and president of the Peace for Okinawa Coalition, a nonprofit organization based in Okinawa City with an extension office in Honolulu, Hawaii, dedicated to promoting indigenous Luchuan culture, history, language, and rights. I have a BA in history from University of Hawaii at Manoa, an MA in history from University of Nebraska at Kearney, and a PhD ABD in history from Manchester Metropolitan University. In 2018 and 2019, I petitioned to stop the illegal construction of the new US military base at Hinoko, Okinawa, receiving over 212,000 signatures. I will be moderating today's panel discussion. First, we would like to turn to Hoshin Nakamura, Professor Emeritus in History from Okinawa University. Professor Nakamura is also a native Luchuan and survived the Battle of Okinawa in 1945, in which at least one out of every four Okinawans were killed. Professor Nakamura has degrees in Asian Studies from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and Seton Hall University. He taught history at Okinawa University for over 20 years and has also taught at University of Maryland and University of the Ryukyus. Professor Nakamura has been involved in the Luchu independence movement for over five decades. Since 2019, he has been a frequent participant at the UN Human Rights Council. Professor Nakamura, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Robert. Good self good introduction. Uh, oh, good. Oh, okay, great. Uh, okay. Uh, in 2019 March, uh, I first present uh, attended the uh, Geneva uh, UN Human Rights Council uh, with uh, Dr. Xu from Hawaii and. Uh, uh, before me, uh, Keiko Itokazu uh, appeared at the Human Rights Committee at the UN Human Rights Council. Uh, she is uh, the upper house lawmaker attending, uh, representing all Okinawa Council for Human Rights and Association of Indigenous Peoples in the Rikis. She appeared that Okinawans are indigenous, but Japanese are denying that we are indigenous. Uh, <clears throat> today's topic uh, covers origin of demilitarization of Ryukyu, human rights violations uh, by foreign invaders, invasions, the military base generated problems in the Ryukyu Islands, and the urgent demilitarization of the Ryukyu, uh, as well as the Pacific nations. Uh, origin of dehumanization. In 1478, King Shoshin went into 
weapon hunt program when many countries, including Japan, were fighting wars within and outside. Peaceful and friendly international relation was established on the spirit of Gankoku Shinryo. That meant Ryukyu Kingdom had been the international bridge of peace and friendship. This idea had been introduced 20 years before by the uh, former King Shotai Kyu in 1458. King Shoshin enjoyed civilian controlled government uh, 554 years ago in the Western Pacific. This is a, a map of Ryukyu Islands located between Southern Japan and Taiwan. Uh, <clears throat> Ryukyu uh, Islands consist of uh, four major island groups, uh, Amami Islands, Okinawa Island, Miyako Island, and Yayama Island, and dividing uh, Western Pacific and East China Sea. This is a map uh, written uh, by non-Japanese because it's in, in English. Uh, Ryukyu Islands uh, is described Japan in parentheses, which means this was not Japan before. Uh, Japan came to take over. This is a city castle uh, uh, during the kingdom's time. Uh, <clears throat> Ryukyu Kingdom was invaded by uh, invaded three times. Uh, first invasion took place in 1609 by Satsuma. The second invasion 1879 by Meiji government. Third invasion by U.S. Uh, troops and its allied forces in 1945. The Ryukyuans suffered three foreign uh, 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 invasion. First uh, wave uh, uh, invasion, as I mentioned, 1609. Three thousand well-trained Japanese samurai, Satsuma samurai soldiers, attacked peaceful Ryukyu Kingdom, uh, <coughs> unarmed kingdom. King and his ministers were kidnapped to Japan. They were forced to sign an unfair and unequal 15 article ordinance. One of the ministers, Janna Rizan, refused to sign the ordinance, and he was illegally beheaded by Satsuma samurai in today's Kagoshima. This is a picture of uh, throwing of Satsuma soldiers setting fire. Uh, this is a group of Satsuma soldiers uh, attacking Shuri Castle. It's April 1st, 1609. And they imposed 15 unfair uh, articles like a law. Uh, for example, uh, all tribute and trays were under Satsuma's control. Uh, Number three, no stipends or property be given to women. Eight, taxes must be paid according to Satsuma's rule, and, uh, and so on. B, the second uh, wave invasions took place in 1879. Against the will of King Shotai and his high government officials, uh, Matsuda Mikyuki of Meiji Japan brought about 600 armed soldiers and police forces to hijack Ryukyu Kingdom. The independence of Ryukyu Kingdom has been stolen by Japan in March 9, 1879. Now the Ryukyu people had to be Japanized by means of political, economic, educational, language, religious assimilation programs enforced upon the Ryukyu people. The Japanese brainwashed, hypnotized, and mind controlled our people day in and day out. As a result, Ryukyuans have been suffering from BHM syndrome today. This is a photo, uh, first photo uh, taken uh, by Japanese uh, at the time of invasion, uh, hijacking Ryukyu Kingdom. So uh, <coughs> they kidnapped the King and his government officials and made uh, built a, a prefectural government in Naha. Whoever opposed against Japan, Japanese uh, uh, arrested and uh, imprisoned here. Japan's violation of Ryukyuan human rights and destruction of democracy. One, the right to speak our language, uh, Ryukyuan native language has been prohibited by government uh, uh, language assimilation policy of Japan. Number two, 
the right to uh, maintain Ryukyu's independence and the right to self-determination has been uh, taken away. Three, Japan confiscated the lands, properties, uh, ancestors' bones from the old tombs and government uh, documents, and they are not returning them yet. Uh, third wave of invasion by US and allies, uh, March 26 to 7 uh, September 1945. More than 200 uh, thousand uh, uh, people died, of whom about 123,000 were the local Ryukyans in the bloody battle of Okinawa. So more Okinawan civilians died or Okinawan citizens died than American, Japanese, and allied forces combined. Uh, before Japanese uh, US invasion, uh, Japan built so many air strips in Okinawa. And at the time of uh, Battle of Okinawa, uh, so-called Iron of Typhoon uh, destroyed everything existed on the surface of the island. This is a convoy, an invasion convoy. So after uh, bombardment, uh, Okinawa remained nothing like this. So uh, I was in the, battle, in the middle of battlefield. Uh, I was one of the survivors. So I saw dead bodies every day like this, everywhere. Japan recruited the high school teenage boys and girls to send them to the war front. It's also illegal. In mainland Japan, they didn't do this, only in Okinawa. So this is one of the high school boys that shot dead, uh, carrying a uh, earth mine. Uh, the ship carrying uh, <coughs> school boys and girls uh, and uh, some adults were uh, a bomb uh, hit by torpedo, American port torpedo. These are some of the uh, people who uh, who died uh, in the sea. Those who uh, succeeded to reach Japan or were uh, staying at the, uh, some temples in Kyushu, praying every day for the uh, safety of their family in Okinawa. So this is the statistics. Uh, the school boys and girls uh, recruited by Japanese forces, more than 1,000 teenage boys and girls died. After the war, former governor Ota Masahide built a, a war monument and inscribed the, all the names of the dead, uh, whether they are uh, American, Japanese, uh, Chinese, European, uh, Regardless of nationality, all the names of the dead in the Battle of Okinawa are inscribed in this peace park. Uh, this is a, an American uh, old man, gentleman, who is, some might have died in the Battle of Okinawa. So war is not the answer to solve international conflict, uh, no matter what. Uh, <coughs> Uh, international friction and conflict is natural uh, because uh, even family members have uh, conflict. So should we solve it by military power or uh, weapon, or should we so should we solve it uh, through uh, discussion negotiation? Uh, when the United States uh, took over the islands. Uh, all the Okinawan island people living in this island were put into the concentration camps. These are the concentration camps. While they were uh, staying in concentration camps, the rest of the island were taken over as a military base. So land confiscation uh, took place uh, since 1945. And Okinawa was made uh, as a keystone of the Pacific for unsinkable aircraft carrier by the United States. So this is a picture uh, land, uh, conf confiscated lands are being uh, converted into a uh, military base after the war. So many uh, farmers lost their farmland and had to emigrate to uh, South America. So this is the largest uh, uh, air base in Kalina. You know, this is a Futema uh, 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 marine air, air field, uh, which is going to be transferred to new uh, place called Henoko, more than part of Okinawa. 
but Okinawan people are strongly opposed against this uh, new base construction. So these are the military bases located in Okinawa and Iejima Island. Not only land, but also uh, uh, fishing grounds are confiscated. These uh, pink areas, uh, no fishing boats can go to catch fish. Also, air uh, is uh, taken away. Uh, Japanese and Okinawan airplanes cannot fly over this area. Okinawa is only 0.6% of the total land area of Japan, but uh, Japan and the United States uh, moved the US military forces and bases to Okinawa, which counts for more than 70% of all US military bases and facilities in Japan. So this is the new Henoko uh, beach, which is being, uh, landfill is being taken place. In this area, more than 5,800 species of organisms are found, and many of them are endangered, including dugong, is the northern limit, in, uh, Okinawa is the northern limit of dugong. Uh, so this is a, a base, construction landfill of Oura Bay of Henoko. Every day people are sitting in to oppose against uh, this uh, construction. In this sea, there are many uh, creatures like uh, sea turtles, uh, tropical fish, and Okinawan people are protesting against this new base construction every day, including governor, former governor, uh, uh, Ona, Onaga. Uh, she, he attended the uh, United Nations uh, to appeal the uh, Okinawa problem. So ex-governor Onaga's speech at the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council in Geneva says, the US military bases in Okinawa have been uh, forcibly confiscated by the US military after World War II. It is not the one that Okinawa wanted to offer the land for entirely. The Japanese government is destroying the public opinion of all the elections held in Okinawa last year. When to build a new US military bases in Henoko by reclaiming the beautiful Koro Sea. I am prepared to stop the construction of a new base using all means, by all means. <clears throat> so this, this is a, uh, 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 no to Hinoko uh, new base demonstration. But Japan's, Japanese government sent uh, hundreds of police forces every day to Hinoko uh, to stop these demonstrators. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hiroji Yamashiro, one of the head of the peace uh, 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 activist, uh, was uh, arrested and imprisoned. So, he was invited to uh, United Nations uh, and to uh, uh, speak about this Okinawa base program. America, you know, uh, United States made the uh, government uh, while governing the Ryukyu Islands. This is a civil administration of the Ryukyu Islands building. And the high commissioner was the governor, the ruler of the island. Uh, Third High Commissioner, uh, Lieutenant General Paul Caraway said, uh, he, he, reversion of Okinawa is a myth. In other words, uh, revert, I'm sorry, not reversion, uh, self, uh, self uh, government or autonomy. Autonomy of uh, Ryukyu is a myth. So in other words, United States and Japan will not give self uh, autonomy or self government or uh, self determination. Military based uh, generated problems are uh, rampant. The rape and the murder of six year old uh, Yumiko Chang uh, by a US soldier in Kadena uh, on September uh, 3, 1955. An Okinawan elementary school girl was uh, crushed to death by the foreign trailer in Yomitan village in June 12, uh, 1956. On March 7, 1996, uh, the uh, three American soldiers abducted and raped 12-year-old 
Okinawan schoolgirl uh, uh, walking home after buying an notebook. Uh, F-100 jet fighter crashed on the uh, Miyamori Elementary School, killing many uh, school boys and girls. And uh, this is a helicopter uh, uh, suspending, uh, flying over the uh, Yomitan village even now. So this is a trailer uh, fell upon the uh, this uh, school girl and uh, helicopter crash took place uh, uh, on uh, Cox International School uh, University, Cox University uh, in 2004. Uh, rape and murder uh, again took place by ex USGI in April. Uh, U.S. military ex uh, Marine uh, Franklin raped, murdered, and abandoned 20 year old office worker, uh, Miss Rina Shimabukuro, in Uruma City, in Okinawa, while she was taking a walk. And uh, <clears throat> land, soil contamination by uh, toxic chemicals, and water contamination, water pollution, come from Futema uh, Air Base. Uh, so it, uh, also uh, uh, noise damage. Military planes flying over the house, houses, schools, hospitals. Uh, uh, Professor Matsui uh, of Hokkaido, uh, Ho Hokkaido University found 10 persons around the Kadena Airbase are dying from noise damage every year. Uh, of course, other people are suffering from noise damage. Uh, the Department of uh, Culture and Environment Affairs, Okinawa Prefecture Government, uh, March 1999, summarized the side effects of aircraft, aircraft noise pollution around the Kadena military airbase as follows psychosomatic health disorders such as sleep disorders, as uh, preschool children's abnormal behaviors effects on long-term memory, uh, a higher rate of low birth weight infants, hearing losses, and so on. Demilitarization of the Ryukyus and the Pacific. Uh, the military-based generated problems have been destroying democracy, peace, and well-being. Uh, military bases aim at war that destroys and kills indiscriminately. War is not a means of solving international conflicts. We humans should learn to calm down, to discuss peacefully and constructively so as to compromise our mutual benefit. Now is the time to discuss uh, demilitarization, demilitarizing our precious world. Uh, in spite of this uh, opposition of the Okinawan people, Okinawa has been heavily militarized by United States and Japanese defense forces from uh, southern tip of island, Yonagoni Island, Ishigaki, Miyako, Okinawa, Amami, Oshima, and Mage Island of Kagoshima. So uh, Okinawa, Ryukyu Island became, uh, has become the target of uh, uh, so-called American Japanese enemy nations. Summary. In 1879, Japan hijacked the Ryukyu Kingdom and stolen its independence in the rights to uh, practice uh, self-determination, uh, uh, like in Hawaii. Number two, in 1945, the US military forces confiscated vast spaces of land, sea, and air that have been severely uh, suppressing the people's right freedom and democracy in Okinawa for past 74 years. Uh, Ryukyan people have 100% right to become uh, free, uh, both from both Japan and United States control, and to restore independence. Nine, 2013, the Association of, of Comprehensive Studies for Independence of the Ryukyan peoples uh, was established to achieve Ryukyan independence again. Uh, for the power or to self the determination is uh, exercised by the leaders and for the leaders of the government. Uh, this is uh, this is a automatic 
uh, autocracy, not uh, democracy, uh, because of democratic government is based on Abraham Lincoln's idea, as, the, uh, as he emphasized, the government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Uh, since time is, sh sh can I go on or stop here? Okay, uh, let me finish. Number five, you can people have 100% right, uh, I'm sorry, I, number six, when the rulers habitually practice their unfair and abnormal behaviors to the suppressed, they soon become to feel themselves as if it were fair and normal. The, the suppressed must raise their voice out, outward for justice and for the restoration of normalization of human rights. So my dear precious friends, please help us, the suppressed Ryukyuans and Hawaiians and Marianas uh, to become free and independent from the outside control. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Professor Nakamura. Next, we turn to Madam Monyeka de Oro, an indigenous Chamorro mother, peace activist, educator and community organizer based in the Mariana Islands. She is a Just Transition Curriculum and Policy Fellow with Climate Justice Alliance, coordinating community-based solutions with member organization Micronesia Climate Change Alliance. She is deeply involved in efforts uplifting the experiences of Pacific Islanders on the front lines of the climate crisis. Madame de Oro received a BA in anthropology in 2011 and a Micronesian studies graduate program certificate in 2019, both from the University of Guam. She has wide professional and volunteer experiences in social justice, historic preservation, environmental protection, and cultural perpetuation. Madame de Oro is on the board of directors for the Guam Environmental Protection Agency was selected by the US State Department as a young Pacific leader in 2019 and is an alumnus of the Sierra's Club Women Earth Alliance 2020 Accelerator Program. Uh, Madam De Oro, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Afere uh, Tiro, I'm so grateful and honored to be a part of this panel to present uh, the question on why and the urgency of why we need to demilitarize the Pacific um, immediately, uh, given the, the tensions in the world right now and the volatility of um, oil and gas. I'm actually like at a gas station right now, kind of like cringing at the cost of fuel. And in listening to um, the dear professor's remarks and the, his long history of resistance in Okinawa, I can't, I can't help but feel compelled of, to bring up the resistance of my ancestors too. Uh, like the Okinawans and Hawaiians too, we, ha we are all island communities who have been and seen and felt and then continuously to today, the wrath of colonization and, and, and continuously experience the inability to exert our sovereignty and our human rights to protect our water, to protect our lands and our airs and, and all of our natural resources in which and all of our communities too are very much the, the, the sort of colonial engagements that have happened in all of our lands and in our islands that we all share is that connection to the military being the largest source of extraction and um, contamination and degradation of our islands. Uh, and in the Marianas, just to give a little bit more of a update um, for the sort of actions that have been happening by the US military in the, in the recent, most recent weeks, there's been a rampant display of posturing um, to the region namely China and Russia and North Korea from our islands. Uh, in the beginning, in the end of January the, and the beginning of February, we, the Marianas posted uh, Operation Cape, Cope North or Cape North in which six other nations um, and over 15,000 Navy, Army, 
Marines um, came and, and practices, practiced exercises throughout our airspace, our water space, um, not just in the Marianas, but in throughout Micronesia as well. Um, and on the ground that looks like so many planes flying low in our beaches throughout all hours of the day. Um, it was troops filling up our air, our air, our um, airports. Um, it was uh, people, it was lots of military people having R&R &R on our beaches. Um, and it was just an increased level of activity, um, which was in one case celebrated by the local business community because it was an infusion of um, tourist dollars, which we haven't seen because of the pandemic. But in another case, it was definitely a strain on our environmental um, resources. And at the same time that we share uh, our islands for training of war and the posturing of, of, of the United States' power in the region, we are struggling as a community in our homelands to um, survive. Uh, we have really high rates of homelessness, really unhealthy communities because of colonization and introduced diets and re reliance on um, imported foods in our islands and uh, real high cases of non-communicable diseases. Um, and all of these are inextricably linked to colonization and the inability for us to um, practice our cultures with our lands. I'm currently on the island of Guahan, but I also live in the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas. And on Guam, the Department of Defense owns a third of the island. And with the, and I really want to pay, um, pay much respects to those uh, fight, freedom fighters in Okinawa who for decades have been militant and diligent in the protection of their lands and in the shutting down and have been successful in shutting down military operations and that sort of fortitude. And I, I see the dear professor and I really get a lot of hope from him and, and seeing how long and how active he must have been in his resistance and his protection for his islands and his peoples. And we very much are in it for the long haul in our islands as well. Um, we have a military base, a Marine military base that was just activated last year. And that's going to be hosting Marines that from bases that were shut down in Okinawa. Um, and that and with that construction of a base included 900 football fields worth of limestone forest degraded and graded down to the ground to make way for the cantonment or the base, as well as the, um, fire, the firing range complexes that uh, will be activated in the next few years. Um, and these, these areas where the military built, constructed these um, uh, installations are pristine environmental and cultural resources. There's many disturbed ancestral burials that were um, found and then disturbed and then destroyed and other ancestral resources and cultural, important cultural resources. Um, and there is, and, the, and they were also in pristine habitats and some critically endangered species are only found in the areas that were uh, destroyed for these military installations. Um, one of them being the Seranthes nelsoni, which is, there's only one mature tree left on the island of Guam, and it's within 300 feet, or the, what the, um, the, the biologists seem allow, deemed allowable for this final species on our island. Um, to exist, to coexist with uh, training grounds for weapons. Uh, and also with that, those fire range, range complex, it's built right on top of the aquifer, the single soul, the single source aquifer from like 90% of the island. Uh, and the prospect of lead contamination and other heavy metal contamination because 16 million bullets are going to be uh, rounds of bullets are going to be shot over uh, on those complexes, the, the likelihood is very high that there'll be water contamination um, in the lifetime of these ranges. And as we see, contamination of water is something that the military likes to evade responsibility for, as, we, as we've seen in Red Hill and Hawaii. And um, 
it really takes an true acts of uh, courage by the community to stand up to hold the military accountable. Um, and also, I want to uplift the efforts to protect Guam water, as well as uh, Protehula Tex and Saber Tidian and some of their efforts to uh, protect our, our lands and waters, one of them being a lawsuit that was just filed uh, in at the end of January with Earth Justice, and that is to stop the open pit burning of uh, unexploited or ordinances right on the beaches of Taragi on Anderson Air Force Base, which is an ancestral site, which is a land which we on top of lands that were never returned to families and families are still awaiting um, their ancestral right to their lands. Uh, and there wasn't enough real information as to what the impacts of these open um, burn pits will be on our islands. Um, but it's incredibly destructive and, 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 and very, um, and very disturbing to the natural environment and also the spiritual environment because those are ancestral grounds. Um, and and, and lat, things like lati stones, which are the pillars of our community's homes um, over a thousand years ago up until the time of colonization are still standing in those areas where, um, and in the surrounding areas of where they wanna have those open detonation burn pits. Uh, and there's still so much happening within the Marianas. Uh, in just in, on February 23rd, they broke ground on the island of Tinian for a divert airfield, uh, and just in case there's an attack on Anderson Air Force Base or other inclement weather in which they need to quickly move uh, um, airplanes, uh, B-52s and bombers and whatnot to off of Guam. They're going to be they're going to be quickly moved to the island of Tinian, which is about 80 miles north of Guam. Um, with that too, there was two hangars which are both hundreds of million hundreds of millions of dollars um, uh, by, paid by the U.S. taxpayers that was just opened on Guam within the last two weeks. So projects for the military buildup of both Guam and the Northern Marianas have been in full swing. Hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars are being poured into military infrastructure. And given the political climate, it just uh, it doesn't increase security for us on the ground. It actually increases the size of the target to have this much more resources and weaponry stationed on our islands. Um, and we've seen and experienced threats, direct threats from North Korea and from China before. And there's been um, propaganda about bombs named the Guam killer um, that just really makes it hard to feel safe and secure in our islands and islands that we've called home for thousands of years. Um, and lastly, just last week, one of my favorite islands, the island of Grota, which is just 40 miles north of Guam, um, that I have ancestral roots in. It's one of the most peaceful, peaceful islands, and it really escaped a lot of the militarization post-World War II, and it escaped a lot of the bloodshed from World War II. So it just feels vibrationally different to have escaped war so much. Uh, they just activated a THAAD, or a um, long-range missile defense system on that island. And it's only an island of 3,000 people. Uh, there has never been any real long-term military infrastructure on that island before. Um, and it's just gonna completely change the feeling. Even though it's just one mobile fad, it just, it's, it just makes the pending, impending war feel all the more real in our region. And along with the Marianas, with uh, there's also a lot of posturing throughout the rest of Micronesia in Palau and in the Federated States of Micronesia to also be boi uh, bolstering the presence of the, the U.S. military in our in our lands and in our waters. Um, and none of this is to the benefit to the people in our region. And none of this, especially in the case of Guam, is done with free, prior, or informed consent. Um, and if there's anything that we see and have experienced with the presence of military, it, it is lasting contamination and it is the loss of life. Um, either, by, by, either by slow slow death with toxicity or with, a, with um, straight up war and violence. 
Um, so we really need to, especially with the compounding threat of climate change on our islands, we really need to find a more peaceful, more um, mutually benefit way to share the earth. We really need to be looking more into renewable energy and more progressive ways of being in relationship with, with one another. Even though conflict is unavoidable with human relationships, there is a way that we can do it that, that doesn't result in nuclear catastrophe and doesn't result in loss of life and suffering beyond measure. And I really hope that the world recognizes the need to have women and, and, and especially indigenous women lead us through the crisis that we're going through um, and put those who are on the front lines, especially with the climate crisis, at the forefront of innovating and finding solutions to make to go through this climate crisis. And one and last they, lastly too, I hope all of our communities here from Hawaii to Okinawa can come together to call on world leaders, especially at the Conference of, of Parties um, and the UN negotiations on climate change, uh, to have militaries uh, not be exempt from climate protocols. It's ridiculous that the United States military is the single largest consumer of fossil fuels and the single largest polluter in the world, yet, yet they are completely exempt from the Kyoto Protocols and the Paris Agreement. They don't have to report their emissions, nor do they have to do anything to draw back on their emissions. And that's a big oversight if we're really wanting to tackle the climate crisis. It's a major or, um, oversight on, the, on, on behalf of the people who suffer from, ho from hosting military bases and on behalf of the, uh, those who are most vulnerable to climate change, which include us out here in the Pacific. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to listening in to everybody else's remarks and I'm so grateful again, Robert, for your invitation to speak and to give remarks coming from the Mariana Islands. Zuis Ma'asi. Thank you so much uh, for educating us about the situation in uh, the Mariana Islands. Uh, we received uh, some comments. We received a comment from uh, Joyce Kaupuiki uh, saying uh, what these people are going through the same thing that we're going through um, uh, military taking more land for more housing for to be used by military families. It's a huge problem. Um, Joyce says, I feel for these people, we are all going through the same thing. Hope they will win. Uh, thank you for your comment, Joyce. Uh, with that, we would like to turn to um, the Hawaiian Islands. Our next speaker is H.E. Leon Kalhau Siu, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Hawaiian Kingdom. He is a prominent strategist, advocate, and spokesperson for Hawaii's independence. Minister Siu is a familiar participant in Geneva at the Human Rights Council and is working to restore or develop new relations between the Hawaiian Kingdom and other states. He is the chair of the Decolonization Alliance based in New York City, a co-author of the book Modus Vivendi Situation of West Papua, and was nominated for the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. Minister Siu, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Oh, mahalo, mahalo nui loa, ma, mahalo, aloha ia, oi everybody. I just, um, I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Nakamura and Monyeka for uh, your presentations. It, uh, very, very, as, as was uh, mentioned by the person who sent the um, uh, comment in, very similar, of course, to our cases, to our case here in Hawaii. Um, and so I'm gonna give just a, a very brief background like uh, Professor uh, Nakamura did for Okinawa. Um, so Hawaii, it was a sovereign independent country and recognized in, in 1843 as a, as a sovereign state among uh, European states. So first uh, non-European country to be invited or to be part of the family of nations, which was, we can get to, into a long discussion over that, but which was the prevailing uh, powers at the time um, over, over the world, basically the colonial powers. So Hawaii became part of um, or became recognized by, by them as a sovereign country. So technically it was never colonized. Uh, that is 
you know, physically taken over until later. So 50 years after that, and Hawaii enjoyed, of course, a very prosperous time in between, but much of the prosperity had to do with um, sugar and uh, sugar plantations. Uh, and that became part of our downfall in that those that owned the sugar plantations began to get very greedy uh, for more profits or, or to secure their profits from their sugar because the United States was their biggest trading partner. And so the uh, sugar planters went into, uh, got into collusion with the United States military that was at that time uh, coveting the uh, coveting Pearl Harbor and the uh, strategic position of the Hawaiian Islands in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, because at that time, the United States had, had convinced itself that it was, um, uh, it convinced itself about uh, a doctrine of manifest destiny, that they were destined to spread their form of democracy or whatever you would want to call it out throughout the world. And the Pacific would be uh, an ideal place to do so. And the Hawaiian Islands was the most ideal place to, to start this from. So the plot was in 19, 1893 to seize the Hawaiian Islands for the United States to annex. Um, and so the plot was from uh, the insurgents here in Hawaii, again, uh, the sugar planters and those that controlled commerce here in Hawaii. Um, uh, plotted against the queen, uh, plotted a time to overthrow the, the queen with the help of a, a military presence of the United States. Actually, <clears throat> it really was an invasion. And although Hawaii, Hawaiians did not resist the invasion, it was nevertheless an invasion by the US military forces. Um, there's been a lot of controversy over whether or not Hawaii should have resisted the military uh, invasion, uh, but actually the, our queen was very wise and actually trusted in the goodness of America and, and international law, thinking that America would abide by international law and uh, denounce this rogue action by um, their minister, uh, uh, foreign minister who was stationed in Hawaii as well as the military that was stationed here. But uh, the US turned out to be not quite as, um, as um, uh, noble as the, the queen thought that they were to be. So even though she filed a diplomatic protest, eventually those protests were, were ignored. And five years later, the United States acted to annex Hawaii. So in 18, uh, 98, the United States uh, annexed the Hawaiian Islands, although even that was a very questionable, actually a very illegal act, because there was no consent of the people or consent of the local of the Hawaiian Kingdom to be annexed to the United States. But from that, the United States gained Hawaii as a military base and started to quickly uh, build out Hawaii as a major military base, uh, a naval base in particular for, for the United States Navy. Um, and uh, the thing that gave them the excuse to do that was the Spanish-American War, which was going on uh, in 1898. And then at, right after the Sp they defeated Spain, which didn't take too long, um, the, United, the Filipinos who had been fighting for liberation from Spain, um, uh, found out that the United States did not intend to actually liberate them, but intended to colonize the Philippines as well. So the United States basically said, no, we're now in charge or we're now the owners of the Philippines. So the Philippine uh, liberation uh, uh, activists and uh, war fighters uh, went to war against the United States and a very, very large war ensued in which around 5,000 US military troops were killed, which is more than were killed in recently in Afghanistan and, and in Iraq. 
Um, but the uh, Filipinos really took uh, the pounding from this, and this is similar to Okinawa. Uh, in, in the Philippines, about a quarter of a million Filipinos died uh, in that war. And so the war was very much one-sided and was very vicious. And it, it, they, to, get a, to kill a quarter million people was not a quarter million combatants. There were a quarter million men, women, and children, uh, uh, innocent uh, people that the United States basically committed genocide against. So as, as we're looking today at, at what's going on in Crimea, um, not Crimea, in a Ukraine, um, you know, this, is, this harkens back to the same thing that happened here in Hawaii. Uh, although we did not have a fighting war in Hawaii, uh, we suffered the same uh, uh, invasion and illegal action uh, you know, and um, uh, unfortunately, no one at that time, none of the other countries which with which with, uh, with which we had um, uh, treaties uh, protested the United States invasion of Hawaiian Islands. But because of that invasion, the United States was very much emboldened and, and took the Philippines and was very much even more emboldened and decided to really plant their um, their hooks into uh, Hawaii as, and, and of course, like I said, annex the Hawaiian Islands. And the sole purpose or the primary purpose of annexing the Hawaiian Islands was to extend US military power into the Pacific. And that they successfully did uh, build up the Hawaii and Hawaii is a, a major military fortress and similar to uh, Okinawa as well. I mean, there is so much military here in the islands, although much of it, it's not quite as obvious as it, as it is in Okinawa, on, uh, in uh, Ryukyu. But, um, the, uh, but it's here nevertheless, and it's also the major uh, command center for the Indo-Pacific uh, Command of the United States which covers not only the Pacific Islands, but the Indian uh, Ocean as well. So, so it's not only the Pacific Ocean, but the Indian Ocean as well. So it's, it is the largest uh, military command in the world, and it's based right here. And as Monyeka talked about, the dangers that this puts us uh, in is, is really quite astounding, because when you look at it, um, if any kind of real war broke out for the Pacific, the war would not be a war like you see going on in Russia and, and, and Ukraine, uh, where there is, you know, boots on the ground uh, invasion, because there wouldn't be any boots on the ground here in Hawaii. Uh, even World War II, when there were marine landings and, and you know, the vicious fighting going on, this is not the type of warfare that it will be in store for the Pacific Islands in the future. It's going to be missiles, and it's going to be possibly uh, nuclear missiles, because there's the only way to, to, to um, defeat the United States response to any kind of, of um, actions in the, in the Pacific Rim area would be to wipe out the United States military forces here in Hawaii, which of course, like in the Philippines, happened in 1898 and 18, uh, two, two, um, 1902, it, it would mean wiping out the, the population as well, uh, and the civilian population of Hawaii. So the entire civilian population and every living thing on the island of Oahu would be completely destroyed, annihilated. And so this is what we're facing. Um, and this is why that we are so um, adamant about the fact that we not only need to demilitarize Hawaii, but we need to remove the United States from our islands because their very presence puts us in mortal danger of uh, uh, attack from one of the US's army uh, enemies. So, um, so this is why uh, we are stepping up our efforts 
to bring this to the attention of the United Nations, as well as the other Pacific, uh, the other nations of the world, um, specifically those who are islanders, to please uh, assist us in, in removing the United States from our islands. Now, um, so this, I'm, I'm talking about these really uh, catastrophic uh, kinds of uh, threats that are to our islands, particularly, you know, in, in the event of a uh, armed conflict. But there are other uh, types of um, dangers that are presented to, the, to us in Hawaii, um, particularly just the simple presence of the United States military here in the islands puts us in grave danger as well. Um, not, not if we, even if we discount attacks from uh, America's enemies, we still are in grave danger with the military being here. And um, Emily is going to be speaking about that and about what, what has actually occurred recently as well as, you know, just historically, uh, what kinds of dangers we face with the US military presence here in the Hawaiian Islands. Thank you, Minister Siu. That brings us uh, to our next speaker, Emilia Kandagawa, a Hawaiian national of African Native American descent. For over a decade, they have been an officer and member of Huialoha Aina o Kale Maile Ali'i, a branch of the Hawaiian Patriotic League aimed at raising public consciousness around the political and legal history of the Hawaiian kingdom under prolonged US military occupation. They hold degrees in political science, anthropology, and land-based indigenous education. Uh, Emilia, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Good evening and afternoon, <laughs> depending on where you are in the world. Um, thank you for inviting me um, I personally, I don't know about those in the audience or those on the panel or those in the future who will be watching this recording, but I would like to take a breath <laughs> after hearing um, these really, um, really difficult truths about our history and reality in the world and how similar they are and how unfortunate that is, um, to say the least. So I just want to take a breath and a moment to just recognize that there's a lot of grief um, that is going unexpressed um, as we try to just get these messages out there. So I'm going to take that moment to recognize that. And I also want to um, acknowledge uh, the two really incredible Hawaiian activists and water protectors, Laulani Tio and Shelly Munioka, who could not join us in person on this panel. Um, they both are so brilliant in their love of truth and justice and the lahui and i hope that what i share today in their place um, can be of value in that same spirit and i'm thinking i think my comments are really um more zoomed out uh in terms of posing questions about the context and the philosophical foundations i think of the the movement for demilitarization and deoccupation but um but even more broadly um all of the all of the movements for justice in the world they're all these are all interconnected things and so i'm uh even though i will be talking a little bit about red hill as our point of reference i think there there are other things that i want to kind of pose to uh to the audience and and i think my i think my comments are also more so geared toward those of us on the ground and maybe less so the people who are in institutions. Um, but I hope that there's value in, in them. So, so, so Red Hill, um, as a point of reference for those who are not familiar with, uh, with this issue, the United States Navy um, has built or did build um, the Red Hill storage facility uh, during World War II to store 200 million gallons of jet fuel and it is 100, and 100 feet uh, above the island of Oahu's largest aquifer. Um, it is in the uplands from Pu'uloa, which is now referred to as Pearl Harbor. And the recent leak 
um, in November of last year that has gained media attention and it's just one of several in the last 80 years since that facility uh, was built but that leak um, saw 350 times the so-called safe limit of, um, of jet fuel in the water and so there are 9,000 families um, in the military who are still displaced there are 93,000 homes on this island that have experienced contaminated water and the military's own people have been in the hospital, but the Navy has continued to gaslight the entire community and has refused to shut that facility down. And two days ago, thanks to the organizing of dozens of, um, of a coalition of dozens of organizations, the Oahu Water Protectors and many others, uh, two days ago on March 7th, the U.S. Department of Defense announced it would defuel and decommission the fuel tanks, but that pressure still needs to remain on them to actually follow through and to not simply relocate it to another island country. Um, they just they do not have the history of good faith behavior, to say the very least, and they've known about these public health hazards for years, just like every other site of military violence and contamination in these islands and beyond, and they continue to actively deny these threats, innovate accountability, and so all the more, all the more reason that we have to stay organized and vigilant um, as, at, at the grassroots level. In the most recent um, risk assessment report that they conducted in 2019, they confirmed three years ago now that within five years, there is an 80% chance of a major leak of 30,000 gallons or more. And so by 2029, that risk is 98%, 98% likely. And that, and that inevitable leak, if those tanks remain where they are, with all that jet fuel, millions of tanks of millions of gallons of jet fuel, there will be permanent damage to the water source for the vast majority of this island. That's 400,000 plus residents who depend on that aquifer for access to water, basic human right. Never mind the millions of visitors who are taken in by the tourism industry every year. So generally speaking, as as has already been illustrated um, by our other panelists, you know the massive negative impacts of military presence and expansion is well studied, well documented. We know that they are abysmal stewards of the land and the people. We know that the United States has been committing these war crimes in the Hawaiian Kingdom and elsewhere. Well, in the Hawaiian Kingdom, uh, excuse me, specifically. Um, since they helped overthrow the government and began the occupation 130 years ago now. So, you know, we also know that the United States military fuels the sex trade industry that is trafficking and murdering cis and trans women and girls that largely Hawaiian and Pacific, um, Pacific Islanders. We know also that it's not a mistake that there's a prison disproportionately incarcerating black and brown people right next to those red hill what red hill fuel tanks um, that's poisoning the aquifer and this happens to be also in a valley with a complex of sacred sites that were desecrated and severed from each other in order to make a road for the united states military's transport needs put the needs in quotes so you know 2022 we don't actually need to prove that they're that demilitarization is urgent and necessary. It's not more information that we need. It's the, the courage to understand and act on what we already know. And we need calls to action. We need a clear and sober assessment of our collective context. So those, um, this, like those calls to action need to, um, in particular, affirm and meet the needs of, of the next generation. So people in my generation in particular, people in their 20s and 30s, and I, I feel like we're in our own kind of crisis because we have been coming of age in a culture where at a systems level, systemic level, we are, we are often rendered effectively invisible where we have, had to become resourceful in the face of material, economic, political, um, emotional neglect, where our vision and our and our agency um, 
our will, the possibilities that we can imagine for ourselves collectively are being undermined in every way possible. And the systems and institutions of power are not designed to, re to be responsive to youth, nor to the, the multi-generational needs um, that, are being, uh, that are being highlighted by these, by these crises of militarism you know, as a topic of our, of our discussion today, among many others, of course. Um, and so again, what can, what can be the call to action, the specific calls to action, given how much we know already about what threatens us collectively and what we know about the obstacles to our shared movements for freedom um, in the face of, of constant devastation and grief and apathy and status quo, how can we feel inspired to act and to engage in the kind of civil disobedience that this hist historic global moment is calling on us um, to do. And so that call to action, um, I would offer that call to action is, uh, is ultimately ceremony and relationship, which are really the same thing. And in response to the crisis um, at Red Hill, as an example, um, the community gathered before dawn at the gates of the US Navy command to hold ceremony for the building of a koa, the, the structure um, to draw in all of what we need materially, spiritually, um, socially, politically, to fix what has been broken here. And reclaiming spaces in that way everywhere possible helps us make change from the inside out and, and, and also helps us to bring joy to the grief that we're also moving through. Um, and we build those same kinds of relationships in Makua Valley, which is another place that's impacted by US bombing and occupation on Oahu, where, where just by claiming space and by being in ceremony there over the years and inviting um, the military personnel to, to participate in that with us, we have observed the, the change in their relationship to us and the potential for solidarity ultimately with them in what will in what will ultimately be the process of deoccupation, um, and that alone is you know just an just one small example of of something beautiful that comes from um, prioritizing ceremony and relationship building as the call to action. Um, and the final thought that I um, that I want to share comes from this brilliant brilliant black woman musician spiritual practitioner um, dana lynn knuckles and this is about um, examining the deep context for how we even think about these complex interwoven global issues so the first the first point is that revolution begins in the body and our body is water period capitalism and white and the white supremacism and imperialism that it fuels indoctrinate us into numbing and, disre and dysregulating our relationship with our own bodies and our relationships to the to the bodies of those around us and so poison in our water should immediately bring us all into radical awareness of exactly what needs to change and the cult the cult of whiteness, the cult of individualism, the cult of American exceptionalism demands that you sacrifice your firstborn if necessary for the cult to preserve itself, to preserve power, power over. And if you doubt the truth of this, you can ask the military, the, the, the US military mothers who are unknowingly bathing their newborn in jet fuel four months ago and was told by those military officers that there was nothing to worry about. So that's the first one. Revolution begins in the body. And the second that Dana offers is that liberation begins in the imagination. We have internalized these narratives and belief systems so deeply of white supremacism, of capitalism, of patriarchy, of, of, of American exceptionalism, the list goes on. We have internalized these narratives and belief systems so deeply that we often don't even recognize when our own thoughts and our own proposed solution, our own proposed calls to action, to um, to alleviate the suffering in our world, they still reinforce the existing abusive power dynamics. And so, what is liberation? Liberation. Um, Dana offers this def this definition that liberation is the act of communal imagining. It is the act of communal imagining. And so, political liberation is imagining together 
the right uses of power. Economic liberation is imagining together um, what has value and how do we use it. Um, spiritual liberation, imagining together an understanding of why we exist and what, what all this life means. So we struggle to get there to, um, to this liberation um, through our collective imagining. We struggle to get there because we have so much trouble being able to rightly identify the source of our suffering. It's often hidden in plain sight. Even th th this crisis at Red Hill, um, our friend um, Kyle Kachihiro um, conducted a tour for, uh, for Malama Makua, my t-shirt, as you can see, um, conducted a tour for us, a demilitarization tour, and he talked about how, um, he talked about that, um, that concept of, of slow violence, the environmental violence, that when you pull up to Halaba Prison, which is right on that same ridge where the fuel tanks are, it's hidden in plain sight, you wouldn't even know. It's the, these fuel tanks are and this, you know, it seems like a very unremarkable ridge where it is, and yet all of this is going on. So it's hidden in plain sight. Um, and, and our imagination is, our imaginations are, are, are colonized. We're unable to escape the, the coping strategy, the trauma responses that we've adopted to survive the, world, the worst that this world has given us to the point where when we sit down and think about, we have conversations at the dinner table, we have conversations at the highest levels of government. When we sit down to think about what we want for our lives and our society, what we want it to look like, we imagine more forms of capitalism. We imagine more ways to accommodate and compromise for imperialism for capitalism, and we just give it maybe a new vocabulary and a new story to justify it. But, but we have to understand the relationship between capitalism and imperialism and the militarism that it, that it produces and all of, the, all of the misery that it reproduces in all of our countries. And we, ca we, we cannot make excuses for how demilitarization is not possible, it's unreasonable. We cannot make excuses to preserve this misuse of power. For 400 plus years, my father's indigenous African ancestors never thought they'd be free of chattel slavery, but look what happened anyway. It, it was as much about imagining something that hasn't been yet as it is about remembering what absolutely once was and can be renewed because it's time, it's, the time has come. And so what I wanna emphasize here is that we need to ask better questions to arrive at solutions and meaningful calls to action that don't just reproduce the conditions that we're trying to be free of. We need to ask questions like, you know, how, how do we build trust? How do, how do we become trustworthy? What does accountability look like and how do, how do we become more accountable? What does genuine security look like? And what kinds of human and more than human relationships give us access to genuine security? How do we find ways to prioritize those relationships when there's so many forces actively working to prevent us and undermine us from, from, from nurturing those connections that will give us genuine security? And so, um, so those are my, those are my thoughts. I, I'm I'm just thinking more more big picture here, and I hope that um, I hope that there's that folks can find some some value in in rethinking that. So, thank you. Thank you, Emily. That was a great message. Uh, a lot a lot of uh, moving and powerful things that you shared. Uh, yeah, regarding the U.S. military's poisoning of Hawaii's water supply at Red Hill. Uh, very, very similar to the situation in Okinawa, where the U.S. military has an extensive history of poisoning Okinawa's water, including the tap water, the drinking water. Uh, this, even just recently, just a few months ago, they did it again. There was an, another uh, incident where the U.S. military deliberately uh, poisoned Okinawa's drinking water with uh, cancer-causing chemicals, and um, and and uh, basically, there's no one to hold them accountable. Uh, they they can pretty much get away with whatever they want in Okinawa, and uh, so we really want the UN, uh, especially the Human Rights Council, to be paying attention to these things 
and to help hold uh, the United States accountable for the poison, well, for, for um, all of their human rights violations, but especially something like the poisoning of drinking water, um, which should, it should be a no brainer. It's, that should be obvious, uh, an obvious basic human right. And yet uh, in both Hawaii and Okinawa, and I'm not sure about the Mariana Islands as well, but uh, um, you know the U.S. military has an extensive history of poisoning the water. So why are they con continually allowed to get away with this? It's it's ridiculous. These are major human rights violations. Um, Emily, uh, you mentioned also uh, about the young people, about how we need to raise up the younger generations more. Uh, we we received a comment from Bianca Kinjo and Uchinanshu uh, saying, we need to raise awareness of young people in Okinawa. I was surprised when I saw only old people in the manifestations. They are extremely depoliticized and manipulated by the Japanese government. Uh, yes, these are good points. Um, certainly we always need to continue to raise awareness and raise up the younger generations, right? Um, I would like to point out, however, that part of the reason why the, the elderly in Okinawa are more visible in terms of, yeah, um, in terms of voicing their, their uh, support for Okinawan rights and opposing the U.S. military, part of the reason why the elderly are more visible is because they're retired. And so younger folks, right? We have to go to work. We have to go to school during the day. We can't all always be out on the grounds on the front lines. Uh, that includes myself, right? Uh, but I'm, I'm certainly there with the elderly uh, peace demonstrators in, in spirit. Uh, I fully support them. And I f try to find my own ways of helping um, boost their support and uh, promote their their voices, such as you know on social media and things like that. And I know some other young uh, Uchinanshu uh, do the same as well. But at the same time, yes, it's still a great point. We absolutely need to continue to do what we can to raise up the younger generations. And um, finally, we received a comment from a user in China. Uh, on Weibo, uh, Chinese social media, uh, suggesting like, oh, we should include Native Americans uh, in our in our uh, in our group as well. And I just wanted to point out to the viewers that yes, absolutely, we do work with Native Americans, um, particularly Native Alaskans, and um, we will be doing another upcoming webinar next week. Um, specifically about the issue of restoring Hawaii's independence and Alaska's independence. So we'll be featuring uh, Hawaiians as well as native Alaskan speakers in that. We will be uh, sharing the information for that webinar uh, soon on social media. So please stay tuned for that. Like I said, that will be coming up next week. Uh, well, thank you so much to all of our speakers. I wanted to um, give you an opportunity to comment or respond to each other or to add any further thoughts you might have. Do any of the panelists uh, uh, have anything they would like to respond to or, or comments to add? Yes, uh, yes, I would like to. Uh, um, Emily, uh, thank you so much for your comments because I think yeah, this is, you hit it right on, on the head about um, where we need to go, um, not just um, not just trying to politically solve things or or do things in the same manner that had been done to us before, but really to do it in an entirely different spirit and with a different attitude. And um, and the, the, this what you talked about inclusion of the people who would we would see, we would basically assume to be. Uh, our adversaries, but we include them and, and we actually get into relationship with them. 
and we find that that they will understand what what's happening. The ironic thing about the the Red Hill thing was that uh, we've been complaining for years about the threat, but until the threat actually affected the people uh, connected with the military, the families particularly, until they were affected because the the, uh, the Pearl Harbor water system actually affected the, the housing areas for, for the military uh, uh, dependents. Um, until they were affected, really the, the, the um, military did not really pay attention to, to our complaints. Um, but when they were affected with their own people, so to speak, who were affected, then it really became uh, something that they had to attend to. And, uh, and, and I tell you, those people were, were activists. I mean, they went to Washington, D.C. And, and just demanded, you know, what, uh, what we've been saying all this time, but, but uh, coming from their own people. So what, what I think has happened is that in Hawaii, we've, we've made a shift where, where the uh, general population of Hawaii is beginning to believe us and the things that we've been saying even more. Um, and, and I think we've turned a corner on that. But um, I, I just wanted to end with one, one uh, quote, and that is um, from, um, uh, what's his name, Biko, Stephen Biko who was a, um, uh, an activist in South, South Africa, anti-apartheid activist, but he was basically the guy who wrote a lot of things. And, and so Stephen Biko said, the most, um, what was it? The most potent weapon of the oppressor is the minds of the oppressed. So, so when, because there had been such a long and uh, protracted uh, indoctrination of our people for generations, you know, our, our, what we had to get over is the oppressors, uh, what, what the oppressors have put into our minds that, that, that cause us to be oppressed. So that's why many of our people still are having a hard time um, just processing uh, a different way of thinking of things. And then we still, a lot of our people still revert, like you mentioned, um, to uh, the same old solutions or the same old processes of capitalism, imperialism, and things like that, because it's, in a way that's all they know. But what, what's, what's great about, about what's happening with us is that a lot of young people are, are now free of that kind of indoctrination that many of us older ones had gone through. And, and so you don't have as much of a battle to think in a different way and to think more like our ancestors thought about how to approach, uh, uh, approach problems on a relational basis rather than on an adversarial basis. And um, so I, I just wanted to, add those thoughts in because I think we're headed in the right direction. However, there is still a great urgency to move this along so that we take the, the Damocles uh, sword that's been hanging over our heads and continues to hang over our heads, that if we can move things in such a way that we can lessen or uh, rid ourselves of the threat of um, becoming engulfed in somebody else's war, um, then, then we will be a lot safer. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Sue. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to offer any uh, further comments or closing remarks? I, I would just like to read um, the comment that uh, Monica wrote in the chat, uh, just so we have it uh, for posterity so that uh, people watching the recording later can see it because the chat won't uh, be visible. Uh, the Zoom chat anyway, won't be visible um, uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, the YouTube chats will be visible. But Monica wrote, uh, just wanted to extend deep, deep gratitude to the historical wisdom and solidarity shared 
grateful for the breath and the ideas about where revolution and liberation seed from. Thank you, Monyaka. Um, Professor Nakamura or uh, Emily, any closing thoughts? No, oh, you're muted. Uh, Professor Nakamura, you're muted. Uh, here. Uh, Professor, Professor Nakamura, uh, you're on mute. Okay. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah we can hear you oh, now. Okay. By listening to the panelists, I had a new awareness, a new learning. Uh, so uh, I've also found the common problems we, ha we are sharing. So uh, I think uh, it's very important uh, to have this kind of uh, panel uh, seminar uh, so that uh, we are encouraged by each other and uh, continue. Uh, we are, I'm empowered by you uh, uh, to continue this uh, uh, independence activity in Okinawa. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Professor. And just, yeah, just uh, just so much gratitude and just mahalo to all of you. And um, Munyaka, she had to leave, so I cannot say it. <laughs> just uh, just for posterity to her, but um, but I just, I'm, I'm grateful to participate and grateful to have heard all the stories that you folks have shared and, um, and just feeling uplifted that this is really like, this is the beauty of what it is to, um, to share the burden of survival and to like internalize that philosophy um, and put it into action in each of, our, each of our movements and to just never forget that, you know, my freedom is your freedom, your freedom is my freedom, so. Thank you, Emily. Very good. Thank you uh, again to all of our speakers today. Thank you for, thank you so much for taking the time um, out of your busy schedules. I know all of you have a, a lot going on and you do a lot in, in your own uh, hometowns and home nations. And so we are very, very grateful to each and every one of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, share uh, your knowledge uh, with us. Thank you so much to everyone um, for tuning in, who everyone who tuned in uh, for the live stream, as well as to everyone who will be watching uh, later the uh, the recording afterwards. Um, we appreciate you tuning in. Again, please um, uh, come back next week for our next webinar um, regarding uh, the specific cases for uh, the restoration of Hawaii's independence, as well as the restoration of Alaska's independence, uh, talking with uh, Native Alaskans, as well as um, uh, patriots of the Hawaiian kingdom, and uh, what the UN uh, specifically can do in this case to help uh, right these historical wrongs in the cases of both Hawaii and Alaska. And of course, it also has a residual, a residual impact for uh, Okinawa and Guam and the Mariana Islands as well. So uh, again, please uh, check back next week for our upcoming uh, webinar about that. Uh, thank you so much to the Kiwani Foundation and the Peace for Okinawa Coalition again for sponsoring this event. And um, we will see you next time. Aloha. Aloha.